ready? All right. So our speaker today is coming from Tennessee Tech University. Uh, and we're going to learn a lot of cool stuff. This is probably the best talk all semester long, okay, for obvious reasons. So um, our speaker comes, uh, did his PhD work at the University of Texas Arlington, and then did a couple of different teaching spots, uh, one in Pennsylvania, one up in New York, and then went to, has been 15 years at Tennessee Tech. Um, so without further ado, Dr. Brown. All right, I'm totally not used to talking into one of these things, but we'll see how I do. Um, so I want to thank Dr. Nelson for inviting me and for all of you coming out here, willingly or not, to, to listen to me tonight. And uh, ultimately, this talk will involve me talking about ripping leg buff spiders, which surprisingly a large number of people think is okay. Um, but at least initially, before we start doing that, if I can get this to work right, if you're an animal, there's lots of things that you have to do during the day or during your lifetime. You gotta find something to eat, find a mate, ideally, um, find some place decent to live. But one of the, the really important things that you have to do is you try, have to try to avoid getting eaten. And so here initially what I wanna do is talk a little bit about how animals may do that. So one of the things that they can do is they, they can try to avoid being detected in the first place. So they can just basically do something so that no predator is going to see them. And so they can do this by hiding in plain sight. They can be cryptic and, oh, I'm gonna screw this up. Ooh. So believe it or not, some, uh, somewhere in there are three frogs. Okay, so they're hiding, okay? So you can, you can hide that way. Or you can hide someplace in a burrow, in a hole in a tree, someplace like that so that a, a predator can't find you. Okay. The only trouble with this is that if you're hiding, you can't do any of the other stuff that you need to do. You can't go out and find mates, you can't go out and find food, or it makes it much more difficult to do that. So eventually, you, you gotta stop hiding and you gotta go uh, look for, uh, for things. And when you do that, you can be exposed to predator. So, if you're exposed to, to being detected by a predator, one of the things you can do is you can try to avoid being pursued by the predator. So you can show whatever defenses you have. We've got these, uh, this fish here with all of its spines showing. If you're a porcupine, you can lift up your quills. You can do something to make yourself look really mean and scary so that a predator isn't gonna come after you. So we have uh, this monkey over here baring his teeth. And so that may keep the predators from trying to chase after you. And that might work, but then again, it may not. And so if that doesn't work, then you've got to do something to try to avoid being caught. And the two main ways for doing this are to fight. And so you can try to fight the predator that's trying to attack you. So we got the zebra over here chomping on the, uh, the cheetah, we've got the badger attacking uh, the lynx. I like cats, and yet I've picked two cats getting beat up over here. Okay, so we could do that, or you can run away. And so we can have animals that are, that are trying to run away. Okay, so each of these is progressively worse from the prey's point of view. Okay, it gets the predator closer and closer to them. Ideally, you would like not to be detected. If you're detected, ideally, you would like to be able to scare them away without them chasing you. If they're gonna chase you, you would like to get away from them before they capture you, but sometimes none of this works and you're going to get captured. And so, if you're actually grabbed by a predator, there's several different things that you can still do to try to get away. And these are our, what I'll just call last gasp type of uh, defensive behaviors, one of which is autotomy. And autotomy is defined in various ways, but more or less it's just the animal deciding, I am going to take whatever it is that's grabbed and get rid of it. And so the animal will intentionally break off this body part. And so, Oops. 
it, right? So that's what's happening there. There's a predator grasping the crab, and then the crab decides, I don't need that claw, and lets it go. The predator is stuck there still holding the claw, and that way the other crab can get away. So you're going to sacrifice a body part in the hope that by doing that, the predator will then just keep a hold of that, eat on it, and then let you wander on your way. Most anything that can be grabbed is potentially something that can be autotomized. So it's usually appendages that stick off, claws, tails, legs, arms on starfish, really anything that can, that can stick out. Probably the most well-known example of autotomy is in lizards and salamanders where they will break off their tail. And so this is a salamander and it has broken its tail off and it's laying there detached. Let's see if this works. I think I need to go over here. And I'm, oh. So the nice thing about autotomized body parts, at least in a lot of cases, is that they will continue to move. And so this serves as a distraction to the predator. So this is a salamander tail that's been autotomized. And it sits there and wiggles around. And the salamander then hopes that the predator will go, ooh, look, there's something moving around, and go after that instead of after the salamander itself. So this happens with a, a fair number of different autotomized body parts. They will continue to move for a while after the animal autotomizes them. Most of the time, if an animal can autotomize a body part, like the tail or the claw on this crab, there's a specific place where it breaks it off. Once it breaks off, it seals up very quickly, so there's no excessive loss of blood or fluid, and then it'll heal over. In some cases, it can grow back. In other cases, it won't. So like the, for most salamanders, they can grow their tail back, and you can usually tell that it's a regrown tail because it's a slightly different color. Other times, they won't grow them back. So a lot of crabs, if, you, if they lose their claw once they're adults, they don't grow them back. That's going to stop it. No, 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 screw that up. <laughs> there we go. Hey, it's new technology for me. I don't know what I'm doing. So what I want to talk to you tonight is spider leg autotomy. Spiders, not all of them, but a lot of them can autotomize legs. So I have various spiders here that have autotomized their legs. So this guy right here is missing that leg right there. If I can get this to the right spot, so it's back leg. Okay, he's got a leg missing right there. This crab spider up here looks like something really has gotten it because it's missing pretty much all three of these legs, including the big one there. I've seen spiders with five legs missing two on one side and the, uh, one on the other, and that's all they've got. So the spiders that can autotomize their legs usually do so when they're grabbed by a predator. And there's a break spot, typically right up here, where the spider, if you grab it, they'll pull and yank, the leg will break off, and then the leg will usually wiggle around for a little bit, the predator's usually stuck holding it, and then the spider will, will wander off. So there's one big benefit of this, and that is that you get to survive. If the predator still has your leg, if you get to run away, that's good. You'd rather have one less leg than be dead. So that's, that's the obvious benefit to that. Okay. I don't know why I picked this one. It just looks silly. Okay. But there may be a variety of different potential future costs associated with losing that leg. So maybe if you're missing a leg, you can't run as fast. 
Maybe if you're missing a leg, you can't survive as well because you have fewer legs to grab if another predator decides to get you. Um, maybe you're not as attractive to future mates. Um, some spiders can regrow their legs if it happens when they're juveniles. There's the energy cost of, uh, of regrowing that leg. So there's a, a variety of different things that could be affected by the loss of this leg. And so that's really the, the point of the talk today. So what I want to do for a, a particular species of spider is first look and see if autotomy is frequent or not. If it very seldom occurs, then there's really no point in looking at it. It's, it's a rare event. We'll go ahead and give the game away and say yes. I mean, in this particular case, there's lots of autotomy. Um, so then, what are some potential costs of autotomy? And one of them may be to locomotion, so I want to see if it affects their running speed. One of them may be to survivorship, so I want to look at survivorship in the field. And then also look at survivorship in interactions with a predator, in this case a bigger wolf spider. And uh, all of the wolf spider slides here have the little icon in the bottom just to remind you that, yes, our spiders are usually missing a leg. So that spider is missing one leg. So this is the star of our show. This is the wolf spider Pardosa valens. It's a really small wolf spider. If you don't know what a wolf spider is, they're ones that crawl around on the ground. They don't weave webs. They'll leave little web trails, but other than that, they don't make webs to catch things. They're ground hunters. This one, eh, maybe a couple of centimeters in length at most with leg span. Females are a little bit larger than males. Um, Females weigh about 40 to 100 milligrams. Males about 30 to 60. The male is on the left. The female is on the right. The things on her back are babies. Wolf spiders are well known for carrying their babies on their back. Excuse me, after the babies hatch out. Thank you. The research area that I work in is in southeastern Arizona. Um, wanting to do the wrong button. This area right down here, and it's blown up, and I'm working in the Chiricahua Mountains um, near a research station called the Southwest Research Station. Really, really nice place to be. Um, and these spiders inhabit streams, and I will be talking about two streams. I've got a picture of each one. They don't look that much different. All of these streams are really narrow, about a meter or so wide. They're very shallow. Um, fairly dry with maybe some intermittent flow during the summer. Um, during the monsoon season in um, July and August, the water can rise up quite a bit. And this particular species of spider is found only in this creek. Okay. If you look on the side, there's uh, all of these, this cobble here, cobble along in here. There's the stream running through there. That's the only place you find the spider. If I go up here onto this bank, which is like a couple of meters away from the stream, that spider is not there. They really like it in the stream bed. And they will be found in this cobble, this rocky area, and they will be found on the stream itself, and they can run back and forth across the water's surface. They're like fishing spiders in that respect. So, the first goal was to determine how frequent leg loss is. And so to do this, it's fairly simple. Me and a couple of colleagues, whose picture you will see later on, um, we went and wandered around the stream. And we did this over the course of four years. And every spider that we found, we picked up. We looked to see if it had all eight legs or if it was missing one leg or more than one leg. And we recorded this. And we did this for male spiders, female spiders, and then female spiders carrying an egg sac. Um, wolf spiders are also really well known for carrying their egg sacs along with them. And they're attached to their back end. So they have this little white packet of eggs stuck to their butt. And they'll wander around and, and do that. And so this is what we found. And I have tried to eliminate nearly all mentions of statistics in this. If you're interested in the statistics, I'll be happy to talk about that. And I'll say whether things are significant or not, but I don't really want to put a bunch of statistical tests in here. So in all 
three cases, intact is the big light blue bar, and most spiders are intact. But there's a fair number of spiders that are missing a single leg, regardless of sex, and there's a fair number of spiders, although smaller, that are missing more than one leg. And again, the most I've ever seen is five legs missing. Four is rare, but at least semi-common. Usually we have oh, four or five spiders that are missing four legs every time we go out, never all on one side. And if you do the math, roughly about 37% of males and about 30 or 28% of females are missing a leg. So roughly about a third of the spiders are missing a leg. So this is a fairly common occurrence. There's lots of spiders running around out there with one or more legs missing. And so because of that, we wanted to see, does this have any effect on what the spiders do? Now, we assume that most of these legs were lost in encounters with predators. Something tried to grab them, a bird grabbed them by the leg, the spider yanked its leg off and ran off, or another spider, or lizards. There's lots of lizards out there. That's probably the way most of them lost their legs. There's other ways. Maybe some got them caught in rocks and couldn't get them loose. Um, maybe they fought with each other and lost a leg. Again, most of them probably did this um, through encounters with predators. So now the more exciting stuff, at least to me. So the first thing we wanted to do is say, does the loss of this leg affect locomotion in these spiders? And since the spiders can move both on land and on water, we decided to run them on a terrestrial racetrack and on an aquatic racetrack. And we did each spider on each racetrack. Half of them we did the aquatic one first and then the terrestrial one, the other half we did reverse. After we did that, and here's where the experimental part comes in, we would take each spider, grab their legs, they just a randomly selected leg with a pair of tweezers, and squeeze. And the <laughs> okay. And the spider would yank its leg off, a little bubble of liquid would form, it would crust over right away, we'd give them about 24 hours to recover, and then we'd run them again. So we had each of them run both times. Yeah, I know, it's, it sounds awful. Um, a lot of you guys would just squish them, so, <laughs> so I don't feel that bad. Okay. So we had them run intact, and we had them run after they had lost a leg. And again, we did this both on land and on water. So this is the terrestrial track setup, and these are my co-conspirators. Dan Fermanowitz, who is my graduate advisor, and Chris Amaya, who is a fellow graduate student with me. And so those are the tracks. The picture in the upper right is a spider sitting in the starting gate, waiting to be run. And then what we would do is we would open the gates, give them a little tap. Most of them would run all the way down. We'd follow them with this little um, stick to make sure they didn't turn around. And then bump them again if they stopped, which didn't happen very often. And then we time them at um, 25 centimeter marks along the track. Now I'm gonna show you the, the aquatic races. I don't have any video of the terrestrial races, but I do have the aquatic races. There's gonna be three spiders in here. The first two are females, the last one is males. We'll make no judgments about, about the outcome based on that. Um, the spiders are going to run from right to left. They're, they enter the water on the right and then move to the left. So that is, that is one that wasn't really smooth in its run. That one was quite a bit faster. <laughs> That's the male. Not all the males did that, but a fair number of males, it's almost like when you drop them in the water, they just got stuck in the, in the water surface. Okay. Very few of the females did that. So 
again, some of the females ran pretty pretty quickly. All right, we'll see if I can, yay. So this is just showing whether they ran or not. And so we've got intact females, intact males, autotomized females, and autotomized males. You'll notice that the yellow bar is ran, almost all of the females run. There's only, I think, two females that never ran, that basically you drop them in the water and they just do that flopping around bit. Males, on the other hand, were much more likely to not run. Okay. So, and again, it was about equally common between intact and autonomized individuals. If we look at their running speed in the terrestrial tracks, we find that for both males and females, they ran faster when they have all eight legs. Not really all that surprising. Okay, if you've got all eight legs, you should be able to run faster. Okay. But males and females didn't differ in speed. They both ran about the, the same speed. If you look at aquatic trials, on the other hand, females don't differ in their speed whether they're missing a leg or not, which is somewhat unusual. Males do. Males run slower when they're missing a leg. But in this case, females run faster than males across the board. So losing a leg affects running speed, but it does it differently on land than on water and it does it somewhat differently for males than for females. And then one of the other things we noticed, and I'm just showing this for the terrestrial trials, is that there seemed to be an order effect. We ran some in the morning and then some in the late afternoon when it was warmer. And at least for the females, it looks like they run faster in the later trials. So there's a, almost probably a temperature effect. The warmer it is, the faster they run. Not quite so much true for the males. So, it does appear that leg loss affects running speed. In general, the spiders run slower when they're missing a leg. So the next thing we wanted to do is see if there was an effect of leg loss on survivorship. So in this case, we went out collected a whole bunch of spiders, males, females, females that had one of these egg sacs, brought them back into the lab, marked everybody with a little dot of marker, which is really, really, really hard to do because the spiders don't want to sit still for that, so you just got to poke at them for a while <laughs> until, they, until they get marked. And then for half of them, we plucked a leg off. And then we took them and released them back out into the wild. And then roughly a week later, we went back out and captured spiders, some of which were not marked that we hadn't caught before, but some of which were. And we wanted to see if there was any difference in survivorship between the ones that were missing a leg and the ones that weren't missing a leg. So we did this in both Cave Creek and Turkey Creek. And... Uh, Again, we did it for the three different um, sexes or genders. So that is what a spider looks like with a paint mark on it or, or a marker mark on it. Okay. So they're fairly easy to see. And the two graphs here are going to look very similar. This is for Cave Creek. Intact individuals are in blue. Autonomized individuals are in red. This is the frequency of recapture. And in all three cases, we caught more individuals that were intact than that were autonomized. So it looks like losing a leg seems to affect your survivorship. And we searched this stream up and down for four or five hours until we weren't finding any more spiders in the section of stream that we, were, that we had released them in. And they don't seem to move around that much. Okay, most of the spiders seem to stay pretty close to where you originally catch them. And then the same thing here in Turkey Creek. We caught a lot more individuals that were intact than that were autonomized. So it looks like there appears to be a survivorship advantage to being intact. Once you lose a leg, your chances of survivorship are lower. And it looks like, at least in a couple of cases, that it may be worse for females than for males. And then so the last goal was to see if we could kind of focus in a little bit more and say, 
if they're interacting with a particular predator, do they have lower survivorship? And the predator we chose is a larger wolf spider, Rabidosa santrita. And that right there is Rabidosa santrita, and that right there is Pardosa valens. And that Rabidosa is chomping on a Pardosa. They will catch these things like crazy. They love to eat them. And so the first thing we did is we just put one intact individual and one autotomized individual in with a Pardosa, or sorry, in with a Rabidosa. So not only am I pulling legs off, I'm feeding them to a big predator. <laughs> and look to see what happens. And so here we have the frequency of who was eaten first. Okay. Oops. Intact individuals right there, autotomized individuals right there. And autotomized individuals were much more likely to be the first one eaten than intact individuals were. So again, it looks like if you're missing a leg, you're more likely to be attacked by a predator or you're less likely to be able to escape a predator if it decides to attack you. This is my other co-conspirator, Matt Stephenson. He was my graduate student at the time, and now he's a professor in Texas. And this is why you don't ever want to leave bad-looking pictures with your major advisor, because that's him after somebody put a bunch of cotton balls all over his desk as a prank. Okay. So in this one, what we wanted to do is we wanted to look and see, can these small wolf spiders recognize if there's been a large wolf spider nearby. So we took some of the wolf spiders, some of the pardosa, and put them containers with dirt. And then in other containers, we first let a rabidosa, the big wolf spider, wander around on the dirt, took it out, and then put a pardosa in. When the rabidosa is wandering around, it will leave little trails of silk, little poop. There may be some other scent cues that it leaves that maybe the pardosa could pick up on. And so we had one set of pardosa that were exposed to these predator cues and one set of pardosa that were not. In each case, half of the pardosa were intact and half had a leg ripped off. This is the setup. So we had a little um, tube here that they could crawl up if they wanted to. There's a, a Rabidosa in the bottom laying down some cues. Okay. The spiders could sit on the ground if they wanted to, or they could climb up either the wall of the container or onto this tube right here. Those are each Pardosa climbing up off the surface. And both of these essentially show the same thing. And that is that whether they're intact or autotomized, the survival time is lower when they're not exposed to cues. So at least in this case, whether you have a, a missing leg or not didn't seem to affect things, but if you were previously exposed to predator cues, you were much more likely to survive. You survived for a longer time. You recognized that a predator was there and did something to, to try to hide or get away. So this right here, those two lines right there are survivorship if you're exposed to cues, and those two lines right there are survivorship if you're not exposed to cues. Okay. But here, autotomy didn't seem to affect things. It's a little bit lower in both cases, but not significantly lower than it is if you have all of your legs intact. <laughs> so autonomy does seem to affect survival. Part of that effect may be related to whether you recognize the cues that the predator is producing or not. And then we also looked to see if there was some effect of predator cue on where the spider was. Because you might expect if there's predator cues down on the ground that you might think if you're the, the prey spider, I'm going to get off the ground, I'm gonna climb up and, and get away from that. And it doesn't look like they do that regardless of which treatment they were in, whether they were intact with cues, intact without cues, autotomized with or without cues, uh, roughly somewhere about five to 
eight of them were on the ground and the rest of them were up on the walls. So they were just as likely to climb if there weren't any cues as if there were. So that didn't seem to affect anything at all. So, I feel like I've gone really fast. Autonomy is relatively common in this little spider. But if you've lost a leg, it appears that it's going to affect your ability to run. Maybe more so on land than on water, at least in females. Um, the female sprint speed was not affected on water. Um, but it is in males, it affects both their running on land and on water. It appears that they survive at a lower rate if they, uh, at least in the field, if they're missing a leg. They, at least in one of the experiments, are more susceptible to this larger predator than they are if they're intact. Um, predator cues may be associated with this as well. If you're exposed to a cue, then maybe you can do something to try to avoid getting eaten. And so, even though autonomy is good for these spiders in one sense, and that is, again, they can get away from a predator if they can autonomize a leg, it's also potentially bad because uh, in the future, if they're missing a leg, they may not be able to escape predators as easily. They may not be able to run as fast, which means they may not be able to catch food as well. They may not be able to chase down mates as well. And their survivorship is just apparently overall lower when they're missing a leg than uh, when they're intact. So we've got this trait that seems beneficial, and it is, again, initially, but it has costs that are associated with it after it's been successful. And so, once again, Rabidosa eating Cardosa, chomping it up. And with that, I will take any questions if you have any. <laughs> oh. That was fast. I was going to say I went, I went way faster than I than I thought I would. Yes, ma'am. It probably does. The picture I have up there is actually from some work that my. Oh, um, she asked if having the paint marking affects their ability to camouflage themselves. Um, the picture I have up there is actually from some work that my current graduate student is doing. And we've marked a whole lot of spiders with a whole lot of different colors. And that's one thing that I thought is maybe if it's brighter that predators are more likely to see them because I can see them more easily if you mark them with silver or white or gold or yellow or something like that. Um, and it doesn't appear that those are the ones that when you mark them are the first to start disappearing. So I don't think so. I don't think there's anything about that particular where brighter colors that makes them more likely to be seen by predators. I can't imagine it has no effect, but it doesn't seem to have a real strong effect. Yeah. Okay, say that again. Um, so it's, does missing a leg inhibit their ability to catch prey? Probably not. Um, the goofy looking guy, Mr. Stephenson that I showed uh, the last picture, um, he did some work on that and uh, both with the big wolf spider when they were missing a leg and the small ones when they're missing a leg. And it doesn't seem like it has a really large effect on their ability to catch prey. Um, they're a little bit slower to do it if they're missing a leg, but they can catch just as many crickets, which is what he was feeding them, if they're missing a leg as if they're not. Um, one of the things that he is not sure of and, and we've talked about is he autonomized the random leg 
and most little spiders tend to grab their prey like this. And so they, they use their front legs to grab them. And so I think if you autotomize nothing but a front leg, or if they were missing both their front legs, it probably would would make them more likely to to not be able to catch things as well. Yeah. Um, in this particular species, they can. So as long as as long as they lose a leg before they reach maturity, then they can they can regrow it. Um, they need at least two moles to regrow the leg its most of its full length. So if you if they lose it the molt before they reach adulthood, they'll have this kind of half length leg. It looks really weird and it doesn't seem to be real functional. But if they do it two molts before they'll regrow a, a pretty functional leg. It's lighter in color so you can tell that it's regrown. Um, we don't see that very much. I don't think the juveniles lose their legs very often. I think if they're grabbed, they're more likely to just be grabbed by the body and, and captured and eaten. Um, so it seems to be mostly the adults that are the ones that lose them. Yeah. Um, He's asking if they were tested with more than one appendage missing. So like on the, the running trials or anything like that, no, we just, we just remove one leg. We don't want to be unduly cruel to them. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the general idea, and I don't know that anybody's looked at this in any serious way or not, um, just sort of anecdotally, is the more legs they're missing, the slower they run. Spiders have, it's called a alternating tetrapod gait. And so they sort of, they, they move legs on the opposite side of their body and they move them up and down. And so if they're only missing one leg, they can kind of fill in where the missing leg is when they step. So if they start missing more than one leg, then they're gate gets thrown off. If you see any of the spiders missing like three or four legs when they try to run, they just, they have this really weird motion. It's almost like they're kind of, kind of limping along. <laughs> that's not really how they do it, but that's as close as I can come without throwing four extra legs. Um, he's asking if they can seal off the neurological, ner any nerves that are going down. Like, as far as I know, yes. And I don't know how that works, but uh, they seal, um, the, the nerves are cut off, the um, muscles. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you would have anything like phantom pain or any. Uh, um, if they would, if they would still send, you know, try to send signals down that what was left of that leg. Yeah. <laughs> He's asking if we looked at the B marking technique. That was actually one of the first things that we were going to do was uh, we, we had a bunch of B tags and we figured out that in order to use them, we probably would have needed to have um, taken with us some CO2 to knock the spiders out. We were trying to do it freezing them. Um, I know I sound awful. Um, yeah. Um, it's really hard to get the timing right so that you don't kill them. And, and then gluing them on the back proved to be really, 
really difficult. Oh, like it, like. Okay. Okay. Um, I have not done that as far as uh, um, anything that I've presented up here. Um, I do have a set of data that's waiting for me to analyze where I've looked at um, specific legs as they were lost. So I have a, a set where I took nothing but the first leg, second, third, and fourth, and then ran them on both the aquatic and terrestrial tracks and I just haven't analyzed that data. So I, I think that for the aquatic trials, the spiders use a rowing motion, and I have a strong suspicion that the back leg is uh, one of the things that is going to affect them the most. Oh, no, that's just... Uh, Yeah, no, we uh, we changed the water out between males and females. Yeah, and uh, um, it kind of it varied from from trial to trial whether we ran males first or females first. Yeah. Yeah. Why did I decide to study this species instead of another? Um, mostly because. Uh, I went out there initially working on scorpions, and then the guy that was pushing the little prodder, um, he did his dissertation work on these spiders, and we started doing this. Um, and so really the main reason is, is that they're just really, really abundant. And so we're, we thought, well, there's lots of things we could do with them. Um, we started looking at the frequency of autotomy, and then that led us into, uh, all right, what, is, what effect does this have? <laughs>